So growing up like most kids, I enjoyed snow days. Well, and it wasn't really for getting out of school being the reason, it was really for the fact that we got snow. Now snow is quite interesting by itself and there's many, many different types of snowflakes out there. And no two snowflakes are exactly alike. And you can get some that grow pretty similar, but um, actually if you go down really, really close or go under a microscope, you're going to see differences. And basically scientists have gone through and classified the different shapes of snowflakes that you might be seeing on a winter day. For example, the simplest snowflake you might see is a plate snowflake. So this just looks like a little hexagon and it grows out with six sides and six points. And a little bit more interesting beyond that is a stellar plate. So we can actually have a plate in the middle and then you actually grow additional plates out on the tips of that particular snowflake. And some of the more beautiful snowflakes that we see are dendromers. So these are ones that look like leaves on trees. So they grow out in spires out from each one of the six points that extend out from the snowflake. Now those are the ones we typically see if we were actually going to look at photographs of snowflakes, but there are a lot of different types of snowflakes. These ones look very regular, they're fairly symmetric and so forth, but there are some more interesting ones that you might see. Um, some of them could be pillar flakes, for instance. So this is where you have a snowflake and it actually grows up in a pillar and a second snowflake can grow on top. Another type of snowflake that you might see, I guess, most often is an irregular snowflake. So an irregular snowflake is basically most snowflakes are irregular snowflakes. The ones that you see in books, the ones that you see in pictures and movies and so forth, those are ones that have been selected for actual symmetry so that you actually get something that looks a little bit more pure. So this has been a question that people have asked for many, many, many years. So back over 2000 years ago in China, ancient Chinese philosophers basically discussed snowflakes and wondered why in the world do snowflakes have six points versus many flowers have five petals. So this was basically just sort of a thought process for philosophers way back at the time. So Johann Kepler, he's the guy that actually is a mathematician that actually figured out how in the world the, or the planets orbit the sun and what are the mathematical shapes that are taken. So an ellipse is basically how planets orbit the sun. Well, Kepler sort of determined this, but then he also was interested in packing of different objects and interested in the symmetry of snowflakes as well. And he posed questions that sort of compared snowflakes to cannonballs. One of the things he noticed was that cannonballs would stack together and you would get sort of these hexagonal packs in them. He wondered, is there something similar with snowflakes going on underneath? And way back when, they did not know about molecules, they didn't know about atoms, they didn't know about the very, very, very microscopic structure of different objects, but actually Kepler was onto something way back when. If he knew about atoms, this whole idea of packing of different objects together is really where the six points of snowflakes starts to come up. So one of the issues with studying snowflakes is it's a very difficult thing to study. How do you study something that if you touch it, it melts? If you breathe on it, it disappears? Well, we basically, you can't really talk about snowflakes without talking about Wilson Bentley. And he was the first person to actually photograph snowflakes at large and at high detail. And the way that he actually photographed snowflakes way back when is sort of the way that we do still today. We would still use the same procedure. We would have a camera and then it would be attached to some sort of lens or a microscope so that you could actually image the really, really tiny snowflakes and the different shapes that those snowflakes would take. So one of the things that Wilson Bentley went through and did is he basically had thousands and thousands of images on slides of snowflakes and he classified all the different snowflakes into those types that we discussed very, very early on at the beginning of this. So why are snowflakes unique? So snowflakes are each unique. They're all individual. However, they may have similarities. They have this six-fold symmetry. They have six points. Well, snowflakes are unique because each grows in its own environment. So imagine a cloud, for instance, and then we might have a single plate snowflake starting out. Very, very tiny, very small plate, but they might be in different spots in the cloud. So they're in slightly different environments, slightly different temperatures, slightly different surrounding humidity. So as the snowflake is floating around in the cloud, it's growing and it actually attracts water molecules. Water molecules adhere onto the surface and it starts building larger and larger and larger. And then you get a large enough snowflake that it starts to drift downward from the cloud. 
So what we end up seeing are basically the end results of this process. So as the snowflake actually falls down from miles above, we actually see a beautiful snowflake down at the very end, and usually they have, like these snowflakes here, six-fold symmetry. The shape of snowflakes comes down to the molecular structure of water. So water involves three atoms. So atoms are some of the smallest constituents of all matter around us. So the three atoms in water are two hydrogen atoms right here, represented as white balls. And then you have a red ball in the middle, which is an oxygen atom. Now these actually bond together. Each one of these atoms has a nucleus, and in the nucleus you have protons, and they're positively charged. And then around that, there's a cloud of electrons. These are negatively charged subatomic particles that zip around extremely fast. Well, when you bring some atoms together, they can share electrons. So that's what we represent with bonds right here. So we have two bonds, and each one of these bonds involves two electrons. One electron from the hydrogen and one electron from the oxygen coming together and being shared. And that forms a bond, and it's more stable shared in this bonded configuration than it is having the atoms separate by themselves. So oxygen likes to form two bonds with hydrogen atoms, so we end up getting H2O or water right here. Now another thing that's interesting about water is that, well, we form two bonds, well, why does it have this particular angle and shape? Well, this angle right here is determined because of the other electrons around the oxygen. So just because the oxygen's shared one of its electrons with this hydrogen and one of its other electrons with this other hydrogen, it still has, what, six other electrons sort of hanging around. So those other electrons basically distribute around the oxygen atom. And because of how they distribute, this is probably a slightly better representation of a water molecule. So I'll move this off to the side. So again, with this particular water molecule, we have two hydrogens and an oxygen in the middle. And what we see right here are these long extended parts. Now these are a representation of the electron lone pairs. So electrons try to group together and they'll take up space around the oxygen atom. And they try to take up space in an even fashion. So we have what's called a tetrahedral geometry. There are four basic spokes that come out. Two of them are bonds to, to hydrogen atoms from oxygen. And the other two are lone pairs sticking out right here. Well, water can interact with other water molecules. So if we take a second water molecule over here, now we printed these molecules so that they have little magnets in them and the polarity of the magnets are set up so that you can actually have hydrogen bonds. So a hydrogen bond is when a hydrogen atom on one water molecule interacts with the lone pair on the other water molecule. So they come together and they basically are attracted to one another. The electrons are negatively charged, the hydrogens are positively charged. So there's opposites attract when we talk about electrostatics. So then you get an electrostatic interaction where these hydrogens want to point towards the lone pairs on water. So then this right here is a water dimer. We have two water molecules and they form one hydrogen bond between them. So starting from the water dimer, we can actually bring more water molecules in and form an ice crystal. So let's go ahead and do that. Let's go ahead and bring in some more water molecules and start building up this structure, or start building up our snowflake. All right. So what do we have right here? Right here we have six water molecules coming together and they form a hexagonal surface. Each one of these water molecules hydrogen bonds to another water molecule right here. And we can see sort of this six-fold shape, a hexagon type pore right here. Well, we can go ahead and build this up even further. by posting on top of these sites and then connecting in between. Making sure that each one can hydrogen bond to the other. So this looks very, very similar from the top. We still have this hexagonal pore, but now we can see that we have each one of those six sides has its own plane for crystal growth. So these top and bottom surfaces, these top and bottom planes, they're called the basal plane of the ice crystal. The six planes on the sides are the prism planes of the ice crystal. So six planes on the side, that's where our six points are starting to come in. So next time you're outside comparing two snowflakes and wondering, well, do these two snowflakes, are they alike? They might be similar. However, they're very different 
and they're different if you go down to the molecular level and look at the arrangements of the water molecules as they come together.